Hi, it's been a while. These arcades are taking way longer than expected, so I'm gonna feed the YouTube algorithm with some subjective opinionated filler about the tools that I like or use the most when I'm building arcades. This isn't a sponsored video. These are the tools that I've been using for months or years, and I've spent my own money on them. So yeah, let's get into it. Number one is a drill operated paint stirrer. You can get these at any hardware store near the paint section, uh, and they are essential for properly and thoroughly mixing good quality or commercial paints when you're using paints in general. So I use paints as opposed to vinyl graphics because one, I'm not really a fan of this look, and two, it's a little bit cheaper than doing vinyl graphics, and it's faster. It keeps the momentum when I'm building an arcade versus if I have to spend 12 hours designing graphics and then getting waiting for those to ship. When using commercial paints, uh, thoroughly mixing paint is very important, and if you're using a paint stick, uh, it just doesn't achieve the same results as you know the manufacturer intends that paint to be stirred thoroughly, sometimes for a few minutes. Using a paint stick is very tiring if you have to mix a gallon, and if that gallon paint has been sitting for a while and it's separated, it's extremely difficult to do it properly with just a paint stick. And having both sizes of mixers, so this is one for a gallon or a quart, and then this is for a five gallon, it's a worthy investment of your time and energy if you know you're gonna be doing painting at any time in the future. Number two are flush cutters. Just get any brand name, they all do the same thing, but having a quality one makes all the difference. And if you don't have this tool and you do any through hole soldering or any electrical work with wires, these are very precise and sharp cutters and they can cut very close to a surface or a hard to reach place. So definitely get these, they're very good. They're for light to medium duty work only and if you wear shoes, you're wearing PPE. So if you do anything of this sort with these kinds of tools, wear safety glasses. Don't be stupid. When you get a nice pair of flush cutters, you will trust them to do basically anything you put in between the two jaws. And that trust will do you dirty someday when they break. So please, wear safety glasses. Number three is my Weller soldering iron. I've had this for over 10 years, so this model number doesn't exist anymore. It's been replaced with something with a uh, seven segment digital screen to tell you what temperature it is. But I've had this for so long, it works very well. It's consistent, it heats up relatively fast. And only once in a while do I have to jiggle the cord because things aren't working, but it's a 10 year old tool and it is my daily driver and my workhorse, and I really recommend just getting a good soldering iron because you don't have to think about the tool, you can just focus on your craft. Number four is a combo pack of my Irwin and Klein wire strippers. Now, these tools do the same thing, they strip wires, but they're their best in their separate disciplines of what kind of wire, what kind of work do you wanna do. If you want very accurate and precise wire stripping, and especially if you it's a certain specific gauge, it's stranded core, and even if it has a jacket or not a jacket, I recommend these Klein wire strippers. They're very sharp, and they perform wire stripping accurately every single time you use them, as long as the wire is in between uh, the, the indentations of the jaws. Now, if you're doing lots and lots of repetition, repeated wire stripping of either conductors like ribbon cables that have multiple conductors that you can lay flat, um, or the precision of the wire strip isn't as important, you just need to strip many wires and get those wires terminated quickly, I recommend these Irwin strippers. Having both is definitely one of those, the sum is greater than the two parts. Uh, because it covers every nuance when stripping wires between say like 16 to 28 gauge wires, which is the majority of the work I do for small scale electronics and arcade cabinets. These two aren't in competition with each other because they perform their functions differently at a different level of quality versus repeatability, but having both is quantifiably much, much better than having just the basic electrician's 
wire strippers you see at the hardware store um, because you don't have to yank on the wire. It holds it for you and it strips based on the length that you set and there's no jerking about the wire when doing so. Uh, so I recommend both and if you can only get one, it depends on the work you're gonna do. Number five is a tool changing CNC and yeah, this list was about tools that I own and I definitely don't own this tool. So that's my one mulligan I get. Uh, but this is one of those machines that will raise your skill ceiling if you have access to one and I am fortunate enough to have access to it. Because the tool changer kind of is more than just a quality of life improvement when making your cam file or making your tool pass because you no longer have to finesse like all the work done being on one bit or stopping the machine to change a bit and re-zero. So you can load everything you can possibly think you'll, you'll need and have the machine automatically pick it up during the course of that cam. And it's a big, big difference if you've used both machines. So if you have a hobbyist CNC in your garage, that's cool. But if you can get more in the industrial environment or just dabble or play with or kind of see and think about what a tool changer can do, it's very, very nice. So the brand of this machine isn't important. It's really about the tool changer. So a CNC machine that has a tool changer uh, can really up your game when you're designing CNC related projects. And if you're wondering, I don't own this because it requires at least the room of a two car garage and costs as much as filling a three car garage with three brand new vehicles. Yes, you can make arcade cabinets without a very expensive or even reasonably priced CNC machine, but I don't want to. Okay, number six is back to reality and it's Eagle CAD with the caveat of using it with an ultra wide monitor. So Eagle CAD is an electrical design software. I use the free version because that's what I can afford. And it's great for making circuit boards or PCBs, printed circuit boards. This software has been around for a while, uh, but KiCAD or KeyCAD is out now. And I don't know that well enough. So I would say Eagle CAD or KiCAD are great. Just pick one, start learning these skills. Don't be concerned about the tool, just be concerned about the skills. But using a software like this, it's very, very, very nice to have an ultra wide monitor because, because the workflow or the ability to work fluidly in a program like this uh, requires you to see both your schematic and your physical layout of your board and to go back and forth between. So having an ultra wide monitor and having zero seam between these two screens as opposed to a two monitor setup just makes all the difference as far as ease of use and fast clean workflow when you're looking at stuff. Uh, and I also use the ultra wide when I'm writing code usually because I forget how to do something that I wrote in a program many months ago and I'm just having that side by side while I'm trying to guess my way through how to solve a new problem. So this entry is, you know, all those programs, but buffed significantly when you're using an ultra wide as opposed to a two monitor setup and you're thinking they're the same, but they're not, just try it, you won't go back. Number seven is my hard drive toaster or more specifically a bit for bit hard disk drive cloner. So a few times I've been in a pickle where my solid state drive that I only have my operating system on I was full because you know Windows 7 to Windows 10 are you know different beasts in size and I failed to buy a hard drive big enough. Uh, so instead of reinstalling onto a new drive, uh, one of these can basically get you back up and running with a magically larger single disk hard drive because you can copy bit for bit one drive to the other. It's also very helpful if one of your backup drives is starting to fail or you think it's going to fail because it's a... Uh, you know, it's been in service for like six or eight years and it's mechanical and it's time to get ahead of the replacement kind of schedule before it fails. So these hard drive cloners or hard drive toasters as what they look like um, have gotten me out of many a pickle and basically avoids that huge disruption of like your main workstation going down. So this thing has definitely paid for itself and I just recommend it a lot. 
So number eight is a light box. And this gives me a good opportunity to talk about a tool that I made, which is just a cardboard box with lights in it. And making one of these is probably better than buying it if you're looking to not spend a lot of money on a cardboard box and a few lights. Uh, but the reason for this, if you do any video or photography footage, and I mean like as something as simple as taking a photo of a video game or console and selling it on eBay or Craigslist, or a YouTube channel where you talk about like filler tools that you use because building other stuff takes too long, having well-lit objects makes for a much more compelling representation of what you're talking about than a poorly lit one. Because it doesn't matter the camera you're using, if that camera optics can't see photons of the thing you're looking at, then it doesn't matter. So a light box is really important. It's kind of one of those underappreciated tools. But when I spent the day making this, I wish I had made it sooner. And something to keep in mind if you're making one of these, it's important to have lights from multiple sources so you don't cast a big shadow in a single direction and to diffuse those lights so you don't have hard spots or hard shadows. So you want basically a shadowless, uniformly lit object. And I unfortunately have to use two light sources because the lights I'm using here are like the 5,000 color temperature range cheap automotive reverse lights that I got on eBay. I, I wouldn't use them in my car, but they are okay for this. And then another like 4,000K bulb on top which lets me kind of adjust the color temperature between blue or a little bit yellowish hue. So yeah, make a light box. It's, it's very nice to have if you're doing anything like this. Number nine are, I guess, technician grade precision screwdrivers. Now, forgive me, I'm gonna go on a little bit of a tangent here, but a lot of the work I do requires tiny screwdrivers and I've amassed a collection of pocket screwdrivers, which have the right size Phillips and flathead blade that I need. But these are usually low quality because they're basically giveaways, either at trade shows or when you spend a lot of money at shopping at something. And these blades will chip, they'll break. They're not very comfortable to use. And especially the ones that have the dual screwdrivers, uh, they are very pokey to the palm when you need to one hand drive something and also push down to grip that bit. So the next step up would be a precision screwdriver set, ones that look really cool in the packaging but have one fatal flaw and that's that they have changeable bits and then those bits might pop out or you're like, I need two screwdrivers at the ready and then that doesn't work. So this set I, I like because it's pretty minimalistic and it has the top rotating part that spins freely to the shaft of the screwdriver, but its greatest flaw is that the bits can pop out if they're really biting on uh, the head that they're turning like a hex head or a Torx head. So this is extremely annoying if you're working in small enclosures where the bit pops out and it's very frustrating. So I decided to spend a little bit of money and you know buy the last screwdriver set that I hope that I'll ever need. And this brand is a Wera brand. They're like a German company and they're pretty well regarded as far as like good quality bits and I can say that they are. So they're comfortable to use. They have the free spinning handle and they have just a small variety pack of the most common bits that you use in this small electronics technicians kind of realm. Just to conclude thoughts, if you're using any tool and you find it annoying every once in a while, it's worth looking into like the next upgrade ability of that tool. And that's really what this is, kind of like the upper echelon of screwdrivers because I use them constantly and there's always one or two small annoyances with the economical solution of screwdrivers. So I went with this, I'm happy with it. It's not for everybody, but it is good for me. And this is my list. Number 10 is a, another combo pack of like silly things, but they're the best that they can be in their category. Uh, so that's going to be a Pilot G2 07 or 0.7 millimeter pen. These pens are awesome. Just buy them. Don't get the 05. It's too small of a diameter. Get the 07 or 10 if you want to look like a barbarian and write with huge, thick, bold lines. And to accompany that, uh, because I live in the USA and we're stuck with 
freedom units for forever, a dual imperial and metric tape measure along with taped to your monitor, a ruler uh, with both inches and millimeters that have the same origin point is like life changing. So if you're designing anything and size comes into play, cause it will, being able to do a half second glance to figure out how big 32 millimeters is on freedom units, it's a life changer when you're just trying to get your workflow done. So I definitely recommend just printing out a paper ruler template, taping it to your monitor, so you can just get over having to convert or figure out, or how to figure out spatially what size is what between metric and imperial units. And a shout out to my dad who has the real life hacks or those people in the comments saying, oh, I just press the inch to millimeter units on my calipers and it does the conversion for me. And that's great, I'm happy for you, you keep doing you. Number 11 is your gentle reminder of PPE. And that's not just eye, but hearing protection too. These are 3M brand hearing protection mufflers. They're good up to 30 decibels, but 25 is pretty consistent. And a 25 decibel reduction in anything loud basically takes away the hindrance of doing any work uh, because it doesn't hurt my ears or I won't go deaf in the future. So definitely recommend if you're only protecting your eyes when you should be doing both your ears and eyes, please don't wait on that. If you've ever f***ed up on the job site and you've been called blind, deaf, and dumb, at least you'll only be one of those things if you're wearing your PPE. And number 12 wraps up our list of no particular order, a decent hole saw kit. When I'm designing and building arcades, I don't know where everything's going to go um, when I'm working on things. And, you know, I build as I go because designs change and they require flexibility. So a hole saw kit is one of those uh, get you out of a tight places when you finally get the speakers you ordered because they weren't back order or you just weren't sure how big of a speaker you could put in a cabinet until it's built, this lets me cut that hole in place on the fully assembled project. Uh, and you know, it's not just cutting out speakers, it's cutting out access panels or ventilation panels. So a reliable and decent quality hole saw kit. Uh, this is a like a versatile one that the arbor is interchangeable, which is fine, takes up less room than normally. Uh, I really recommend a good hole saw kit. Just spend the money because it'll last and you will appreciate a good quality hole saw kit when you get to use one. Okay, wow, here's the outro. This video was a long rambling about tools, but these are the ones I use a lot and they make a big difference as far as the quality of the tool or at least the implementation of it. So some honorable mentions that I have for this list, because why not? A decent set of calibers, um, Mitutoyo or Mitutoyo, Mitutayo, whatever. Good calipers. A combination square. If you don't have one of these or you do and you're not sure of its use, ask someone who knows, it's pretty neat. And then clamps, uh, but not just any clamp. I like Bessie clamps. They are the clampiest. They're not nearly as expensive as you think if you're used to these squeeze clamps. So yeah, please get these ones. Well, thanks for watching. I'm still working on these arcades. They're taking a while, so they'll be ready when they're done and I'll do a video about them and those plans will be finalized and I'll also have them available. Until then, see you later.